Hi guys, welcome. Hello this afternoon, everyone. Nice to join us. Uh, thank you for joining us rather. Can I introduce Kadar? He's a great friend. He's a good guy from cardiology. We're very lucky to have him. He's one of the advanced trainees and he's going to talk to us this week about MI complications. So thank you very much for joining us, Kadar. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, awesome. No problem, Mouse. Uh, Mouse is on here. Nice to All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. I just wanted to present on MI complications, an important topic uh, because there are you know, a number of uh, is uh, acute coronary syndrome is increasing, and obviously uh, it's important to recognise these complications. Now they're not as often, uh, not as common these days, but uh, still important to recognise nonetheless. So I'd like to start off with a um, a case example, and this is the story of S R. He's a 41 year old warehouse worker who presented at 4 a.m. one day with central chest tightness radiating down his left arm. He presented at 11 a.m., so approximately you know, seven hours later to the emergency department and denied any respiratory symptoms or, or in dyspnea as such. His background is he just has childhood asthma and he just uses ventolin as required. He's a non-smoker, has no type of diabetes, hypercholesterolemia or hypertension. And in terms of family history, his uncle had ischemic heart disease in, in his 60s. Uh, but he has no other first degree relatives of his skill with ischemic heart disease as such. So I'd like to kick off with the ECG, uh, the pivotal point in our decision making really for us cardiology, uh, I guess, uh, doctors. Um, does anyone want to try to interpret what they see here? It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Have a great, you can pick anyone. We've got Emma. Emma, do you want to have a look at this? You knew I was going to pick on you, didn't you? Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm just walking back from the gym. It might be a bit windy and stuff. Like <laughs> <laughs> oh, good on you for joining uh, on the way back to the gym. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, maybe Joe or Kylie? Oh. Um, well, there's a, it's a broad, complex tachycardia with Q waves in V1, V2. Oh, it's gone. Sorry, um, sorry, it's, it's me. I'm messing with it. With ST elevation as well, um, anterolaterally. Yes. The, what, what is, what is um, characteristic of this type, this morphology of the QRS? What, what else do you think? What kind of morphology do you see here? Um, Does it look like a particular type of, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, conduction delay or, 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 you know, sort of character? Left bundle, left bundle. Uh, more of a right bundle, maybe? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, I can see. Yeah, yeah. Right under the air. so so it's it's sort of it's not only just ST elevation; it's also a right bundle plus ST elevation, and um, and as you rightfully said, in the anteroceptal leads, there's ST elevations V1, V1, V5 with incomplete right bundle type morphology, and there's also presence of Q waves in the uh, anterior leads V1 to V4. Um, this is a large anterior stemi, and what's really worrying about this is that the right bundle branch block implies the infarct is big enough to start affecting the intrinsic conduction system on the other side. So say, for example, the LAD is affected, you, you know, if you get a new left bundle branch block, as we know, that's a surrogate marker of a stemi, but if the right bundle is affected, then that's a massive infarct affecting the septum. So that's what's worrying about this particular ECG. It's quite deadly. Um, so SR was given aspirin, uh, tagagro, heparin, and tolvastatin as per standard STEMI protocols and taken to the cath lab. It was commenced in a tyrofibane infusion as well, which is a glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitor. And the first drop was massive, it was above 25,000 with a CK of 2,800. Um, so this is his angiogram. And so just to orientate yourself, on the left-hand side, you've got the, um, the engagement of the left coronary artery with the left main stem there that trifurcates or splits into three. You've got the LAD, which runs along, along the top there, the intermediate artery, ramus intermediate, and the circumflex artery. And obviously here, the most marked thing is that the proximal LAD is occluded. It's basically a stump there. Um, which is a culprit lesion. So we go ahead and fix it with wire it, balloon it, put a stent in, post dilate the lesion, and flow is reestablished after uh, after aspirating the clot and opening up the artery there. So this is just an example of how we do the wiring and so on. So we put a wire down the LAD um, in an acute in a STEMI situation. There's usually acute thrombus there, which is easy easy to punch through. 
um, with a wire, so it's easily punched through and um, a stent is deployed and there's much better flow down the LAD in the second shot, essentially. And obviously the more chronic a lesion, the harder it is to stick the wire down through it. Correct, correct. So the, the, the more of underlying atherosclerosis there is, or for example, if the vessel is chronically occluded and it's extremely calcified and hard, uh, it's, it's very difficult to sure. wire. So that's the difference. Um, the right coronary artery is essentially a small non-dominant vessel without any major disease as such. So we've got a culprit lesion in this particular individual. So after the PCI, he had no further chest pain, uh, but he had persistent ST elevation in the anterior leads. And so the tyrofiber infusion was continued for a total of 24 hours. He had multiple pace calls for hypotension. His blood pressure dropped from 110 on 70 to 95 on 60. His heart rate was 92 and he was partially responsive, uh, responsive to fluids. So this is an echocardiogram. Um, uh, anyone want to try to interpret this for us? Yeah, so Hatim, who's just joined us, he is doing his exams this week, so he, uh, sorry, this year. Hatim, are you able to see this stuff? Yeah, 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 yep. Okay, so the one on the left side of the screen is a long, uh, personal long access view uh, showing it's very slow projection on my side, but what I can see that the uh, left ventricular size looks within reason, uh, RV size looks within reason, uh, the other chambers as well, left atrium doesn't look particularly enlarged, and mitral valve motion looks, um, so function of the left ventricle, as well as the mitral uh, valve, the anterior mitral valve leaflet, it looks like mildly impaired, at least mild to moderate impairment. Mm -hmm. And the aortic root looks within reason and nearly the same size as the left atrium. I cannot see any sizable pericardial effusion and I cannot see much of the lung. From the other, from the right side, this is a short axis view at the mid papillary muscle level. And that's again showing that there's regional motion abnormalities uh, consistent with the septum. Akinesia mm -hmm. and uh, anterolateral wall is again at least hypokinetic, and the uh, inferior wall is posterior wall is contracting. Uh, yeah. Yep. Exactly. So that yeah. features. Yeah. So that features would be consistent with uh, an LAD uh, proximal occlusion. If it's an acute context, this doesn't look like scar tissue, so more likely it represents an acute infarction. Perfect. So the entire uh, anteroceptum, uh, as you can see in the, the parasternal wall axis, is is from the basal segment all the way down. Obviously, we don't have apicals just yet, but it's it's essentially akinetic, as you can as you write for a set. Sam, do you have a fairness? No, that's perfect. Yeah. So um, here is the the next set of images. If someone else wants to add on to that. Kylie, do you want to have a, look at, uh, have a go to carry on? Yeah, sure. I should have put my glasses on. Can I say <laughs> that I'm loving this input because we don't have angiography where we are, so it's fantastic to see the pictures, by the way. Okay, on the left, uh, apical four-chamber view with um, obvious apical akinesis, um, mobile mitral valve, mobile tricuspid annulus and small right ventricle, slightly rounded right atrium, still pointy left atrium, um, no obvious pericardial effusion. I promise to put my glasses on in a minute. Um, on the picture on the right, it looks like a two chamber view centered on the left um, ventricle. Again, we've got the apical akinesia. The posterior wall has got Oh, probably adequate movement. The anterior wall has got some movement at the base, but it dies out around the mid and the apex. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, do you, what do you think of this thing? So you, can, can, uh, there's can you some see swirling. That? I think I can see some swirling yeah, in there. Yeah. spontaneous echo contrast, which will mean there'll be turbulence, which will mean this chap's going to be at high risk of an apical thrombus. Yes, uh, excellent. And it's also a bit aneurysmal here, this, this apex could have ballooned out appearance as well. Oh, so, yes. Yeah, and you can see here on the three chamber, the anteroceptum again um, is a kinetic, the slight ballooned out appearance of the apex. 
And we look, let's put color Doppler, color Doppler across the mitral valve. There's a small degree of ischemic MR there, um, as you can see. So, you know, a set of bloods were done and uh, essentially the main thing here is that he's um, this persistently high troponins with LFT derangement, increased lactate indicating the development of end organ hyperperfusion and increasingly the inflammatory markers are also elevated. Uh, you know, there could be a concurrent pericarditic process as well. The white cell counts up, the CRP is up as well, as you can see. So, you know, um, he was commenced on IV fluids uh, with judicious use and important to monitor fluid balance carefully because his EF is down. Um, he was commenced on dobutamine infusion as a positive inotrope as such, and also colchicine 500 mics twice a day. Um, over the course of the next three days, his blood pressure and even improved. The dobutamine was stopped. He was commenced on anti-failure therapy of bisoprolol and ramipril. He was continued on dual antiplatelets and he was essentially well enough to be discharged with close cardiology follow-up. So uh, in terms of uh, our numbers over time for STEMIs, uh, they have been increasing uh, overall. In 2016, there were 139 STEMIs, uh, whereas in 2019, that number has gone up to 219. Now last year, because of COVID, the STEMI numbers are a bit skewed and weird. I um, haven't got that data at the moment, but what we also found is that the number of younger patients overall uh, with STEMIs is increasing as well. And just recently, we've had a lot of patients in their 30s and 40s with massive infarcts coming through. Um, so this is a, a graph showing STEMI trends over time and the number of patients below the age of 55 has gone up from 36 to 72 from 2016 to 2019. Uh, the difference is more drastic in patients under the age of 40, going up from two to 13 over the same time period. So am I in the young... Um, Overall literature pertaining to the developed world, the rates of ACS are declining. There is a blunted trend in the uh, young patient population of less than 55 years old. Some contributing factors could be delayed and atypical presentations. If you remember, Mr. SR came seven hours after his pain onset. He thought he could bear the pain and had a delayed presentation, which unfortunately led to his aneurysm developing and so on. Um, Non-adherence treatment is very important. Uh, we have a 36 year old recently who had a previous stent, but um, stopped taking his aspirin and then had a massive STEMI with instant uh, throat restenosis essentially. And lastly, syndromes unique to this age group include these sort of uh, myocardial infarctions with not obstructive coronary. So things such as SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, coronary vascular spasm with drug use such as cocaine. Just yesterday, we had a large uh, <laughs> a patient with a large STEMI who had a massive amount of SCAD. So a lot of coronary artery dissection as well. Unfortunately, I don't have those pictures at the moment, but there was a case. So does someone have a question? No, okay. So in terms of risk factors for MI in the young, smoking has been seen to be the most important risk factor. The Interheart study in 2004, show that the odds ratio in young patients is 3.33 versus 2.44 in older individuals. Uh, family history of premature coronary disease is important, uh, 41 to 70% of young MI patients. There is a bit of a gender bias. In 2006, there was a study which showed that 90% of patients less than 45 years old are male compared to 68% of older patients. Hypercholesterol limit is a bit of conflicting data. There's less prevalence of diabetes and hypertension overall, but obesity seems to be the new age trend that's contributing to MI in the young as well. So let's go to the meat of the, of the talk, which is the actual acute complications of ST elevation myocardial infarction and myocardial infarction in general. Um, these are less common, as I mentioned, in the modern era, as we treat patients with STEMIs faster, the dodo balloon times have obviously gone down, gone down over the years, but especially for patients who are late presentations or, uh, and, and people working on the ward, it's important to recognize the, these complications because they can be deadly if they're missed. And these range from hemodynamic disturbances to physical mechanical complications of MI, and they are higher risk for patients who present late into their infarct. So going through hemodynamic disturbances first, <clears throat> the LV function is an important predictor of mortality post-infarct, and you can get concomitant systolic and diastolic failure. Systolic failure is predominantly responsible, this function is predominantly responsible for the depression of cardiac output, and diastolic dysfunction can lead to pulmonary congestion. It's the aim is to reduce LV preload and afterload and avoid arrhythmias in this situation. 
Um, oxygen support is important uh, and judicious use of diuretics if acute pulmonary edema occurs, uh, you know, uh, to maintain effectively cor effective coronary perfusion, avoid excessive reduction of LV feeling pressures um, is important as well. So with right ventricular failure, and I know you guys are quite expert in this particular <laughs> topic, uh, these can it often underappreciated and RV failure can be quite difficult to deal with. They more likely occur in inferior STEMIs, and these patients are quite sick and develop a slew of issues, including bradyarrhythmias and hypotension. Um, any comments, Sam, on this particular topic? Uh, I mean, uh, as you say, I, I think the treatment is very different from this compared to other types of right ventricle failure. You know, I think judicious fluids are really important in this group, whereas I think in other forms of heart failure, we see we're saying, you know, don't avoid, you know, avoid fluids at all time because mm -hmm. you could, you know, preload. Uh, uh, preload overload of the RV can be bad. So, and pacing is a lot more important in these groups. Yeah. So I just think they're a kind of an entity unto themselves. Yeah, absolutely, the absolutely. Right. And, and, you know, recently we had an inferior infarct where uh, the patient was bradycardic and hypertensive. So we had to put a temporary wire at the mm -hmm. time, at the time of the actual uh, angiogram as well. So cardiogenic shock, moving on to this, the incidence rate's approximately five to 10%. Uh, risk factors are older patients with prior MIs, uh, pre-existing heart failure or anterior STEMIs are more likely to get this condition, characterized by persistent hypertension, reduction in cardiac index, and elevated left ventricular end diastolic pressure, a wedge of above 18, essentially. There's also evidence of end open hyperperfusion, as was seen in the case of SR, reduced loss of level of consciousness, shutdown peripheries, all urea, and so on and so forth. So in, in cardiogenic shock, the COMMIT trial, uh, which was 2005 trial, randomized control trial, was showed the metoprolol used in the first 24 hours in, from a STEMI increased the rates of cardiogenic shock. Um, instead, beta agonists such as dobutamine or dopamine may be considered. As you guys know, dopamine has positive iotropic activity similar to dopamine, but less vasoconstrictor activity and positive chronotropicity, whereas dopamine has vasodilatory effects on the renal and splanking vessels. Any comments about these medications used? Uh, we don't really use dopamine much in, in the cardiology setting uh, here anyway. Yeah, it's, um, been, it's kind of gone out of favor in ICU for a number of reasons. We've got a few data that suggest that you know, the vasodilatory effects you're yeah. seeing in the renal yeah. spanking vessels actually doesn't have any uh, uh, any sort of prognostic uh, or uh, you know benefit for, for trying to improve blood flow in those vessels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we come to the intra-aortic balloon pump, and uh, this is inserted by the femoral artery normally. It sits in the descending aorta above the level of the renal artery normally. It's deflated in systole to decrease afterload to facilitate increased cardiac output, but inflates in diastole to improve coronary perfusion. It's primarily used in uh, unstable patients around the time of PCI to assist with the hemodynamic support. Now there's arguments for inserting the balloon pump before the actual PCI part, or after, depending on what the, what the situation has been. Although the, um, and I, everyone quotes the SHOCK2 trial, <laughs> um, randomized control trial in 2012, didn't show the mortality benefit of balloon pump in 30 days uh, with cardiogenic shock. Um, it has been inserted in our department uh, quite a few times now in the last year or so uh, as more of a temporizing measure, um, sometimes to uh, invasive therapy or even transplant. Um, so this is another device called the impeller, which I'll show you how it works. I'm sure you guys are aware of it. But essentially, um, it's a mini left ventricular assist device inserted percutaneously via the femoral artery again, uh, actively unloads the left ventricle and has a low adverse and uh, event rate is relatively easy to manage with minimal complications. The limiting factor here is cost availability and also very importantly, um, you need a large sheath, a large uh, French sheath, about 12 to 14 gay, uh, French uh, in the femoral artery to actually facilitate the, um, the input of this, and which is why it's a limiting factor. The cardiologists have to be trained in, in managing large sheaths. Um, any word on the, on the sphere of this device in between us? Yeah, yeah I mean, we're, we'd love to be using this a bit more. I think it can, so it can generate flows up to three liters, I think it is. Uh, and that's incredibly enticing for some of our patients. We don't have ECMO here. Some of these guys work in ECMO centers um, and they're sort of experienced with that. And that's something that we don't have. And I guess when we're seeing balloon pumps fail, you know, ridiculous levels of catecholamines, things like impellers have, uh, you know, potential to, potential to save lives as I see it. Yes. 
So moving on to the mechanical complications, which can be quite um, impressive sometimes. Um, first of all, the LV aneurysm occurs after a large infarct, infarct leads to hypokinetic thin scarred myocardium. Uh, it's relatively uncommon with an incidence of less than 5% after an ST elevation myocardial infarction, but it's four times more likely at the apex compared to the infraposterior wall. A clue on ECG is persistent ST elevation, um, which doesn't really subside in the post-infarct period, as well as, um, you know, echocardiogram showing a large infarct with regional wall motion abnormalities. Death is six times more likely to occur in these patients and usually from sudden ventricular tachyarrhythmias. And the role for surgical intervention is dubious at this point. There's a trial in 2009 called the STITCH trial that showed no clinical benefit in reconstructing the ventricle on top of cardiac bypass. Um, and left ventricular thrombus is, uh, can occur when, uh, you know, during infarction and endocardial inflammation provides a thrombogenic surface. Uh, for example, if you have a large enough in infarct, especially with akinetic segments, such as the apex occurring next to hypokinetic segments, so contiguous akinetic hypokinetic segments, um, this facilitates thrombus formation. Uh, the prognosis is poor in these patients when it occurs early, whereas, whereas the risk of systemic embolization is quite high. The treatment of, with warfarin normally for three to six months, although there is emerging evidence that NOAX can be used in left ventricular thrombus. So here's another echocardiogram uh, for interpretation. Lewis, are you there? Do you want to have a look at this one? Hi, uh, yep. Yeah. Um, so you want me to interpret? Yeah. So a uh, abacal four chamber with um, an obvious apical akinesis and a apparent... Um, uh, mass in the apex that um, doesn't appear to be contiguous with the ventricular wall and has a heterogeneous opacity um, concerning for thrombus. Um, interestingly, there appears to be um, normal myocardial contraction in the, uh, in the basal and mid segments. Um, so I'm wondering whether uh, this is a Takasubo um, uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, is there anything that points against that on the 2D image? Mm, interesting on the 2D image. And, and you called it a thrombus. Uh, so again, you, it's, it's hard to say exactly what it is. I mean, certainly there are clues that point towards that, obviously, but could it be anything else, I guess, is the guy? Didn't I say a mass? Oh, did you say mass? Sorry, but you said thrombus. Yeah. Sorry. Very good, very good. That could be consistent with an LV thrombus. Nice. Mm -hmm. but why is, why, I don't think it's a Takasubo. I could be wrong, but. So there's there's no ballooning of the apex, but that's not a requirement. Um, there's this apical akinesis. Um, there's some, cal there's some um, hyperechoic phenomenon over on the sort of, uh, yeah, nice. That's it. Yeah, what about I'm, this bit here? Can we see the mouse? What's happening here? Um, so I think there's a hinge point there. Yeah, as well as being a hinge point. What do you think about the thickness? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I can nice. see it better when I, I think I, the thickness I, changes yeah. right there and there. Yeah. Okay, and, that's, and I guess that's the difference between acute versus chronic ischemia, right? Mm -hmm. So it's chronic ischemia, it's going to get thinned and scarred, which is what yep. I think you've got there. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a Takasubo or something where if, you know, you differentiate between LAD and Fartra versus Takasubo, you know, that's, if you're talking about acute ischemia, it stays thick, it's just hypokinetic or akinetic. Yep, good on. Yep, it's definitely thin. Cool. Uh, and Lewis, can you Sorry. comment on the right-hand side picture? Does that help you at all? Yeah, so I think that probably, um, so in the context of that clinical scenario, that's a, uh, that's a ultra hand, ultrasound enhancing agent scan um, with adequate opacity of the left ventricle that demonstrates a, um, a non-perfused uh, um, apical cap. Yep. 
as well as a... Um, so so you're, you're, you're referring to this black segment here, is it? Yeah, yeah, I'm referring yeah. to myocardium. Yeah. Um, yeah. The non-perfused uh, myocardium um, with a, uh, I, I want to say LV thrombus, but I'm trying to think of how else to describe. Uh, say, say, say it was, say it wasn't a thrombus. Would you expect that to also be, uh, you know, so, so th this is contrast agent within the left ventricular cavity, and there's a filling defect there, isn't there? Yeah, so, so there's, there's filling. There's a filling defect that. Um, that I guess looking at the other picture um, doesn't appear to be continuous with the left ventricular wall. Yes. And so, so if it was artifact, for example, then you would expect contrast to fill to fill the entire uh, left ventricular cavity. And here there is a filling defect. And in combination with the thin scarred apex, the microvascular obstruction, which is this black segment here, and this this large um, mass here, which correlates with the 2D image. And has 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 no perfusion. Mm. Um, in context of all those three things, this is most likely an LV thrombus. Do you agree? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we go to more impressive complications now. Uh, these are quite rare in the acute in the modern era, but important to recognize. So uh, acute vent left uh, acute ventricular septal defect um, is a sudden onset hypotension and failure post MI uh, with inadequate tissue perfusion is how it normally presents. Risk factors being female, age above 70, the first uh, infarct, the patient having their first infarct, late presentation and hypertension. Occurs normally two to five days after the event and the magnitude of the left to right shunt inversely proportional to the infarct. Uh, why, why do you guys think that is? Magnitude is inversely proportional. So the bigger the shunt, the less the infarct. Mm. I know, I know, maybe. Um, yeah, go ahead. Is it because the bigger infarct therefore has less force and can generate less pressure pushing the, sh the blood into the right? Yes. I guess. So if you have a small infarct but manage to rupture the septum, then the left ventricular function is relatively preserved. Right. Whereas, you know, um, and, and vice versa. Uh, because, because when you have a small infarct that's, that, that punctures the septum, then the left ventricle is powerful enough to shunt a lot of blood through the defect into the right ventricle. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. yeah. Okay, so this is an example of a flail septum, um, uh, whereas anterior, inf anterior infarcts resulted apical VSDs towards the apex of the heart, whereas inferior um, MIs re resulted in more basal VSDs. It's important to listen to the chest for a harsh holosystolic murmur after anyone having an MI at the left sternal edge that's accompanied by a thrill for the ventricular septal defect. And this one, this transthoracic echo four chamber view shows uh, the infrabasal septum is tethered near the mitral and tricuspid valves, but highly mobile, creating a large VSD. Um, and putting color Doppler, you can see that there's free flow of blood essentially from between the left and right ventricle. Uh, you know, this patient is very sick. <laughs> so what do you guys see here? So you may, you may see it relatively normal at first. So you do, you do a three chamber view, um, you know, at first, let me just pause this for a second. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure I can pause it, but Sorry. When, when, you, when you start, the three chamber view looks relatively normal, but then you pan through it, and you can actually see that there's a, a shredded septum. It's called a shredded septum. Acute mitral regurgitation uh, has two main mechanisms in which it occurs. Uh, if the papillary muscle ruptures, you get the entire leaflet and apparatus can reflux during systole. Uh, the other type is called ischemic MR, which is tethering of the leaflet, essentially. So this is a transesophageal echo uh, where the chambers are flipped upside down. So left ventricle obviously is the bottom of the image, left atrium at the top and so on. Um, the piece of papillary muscle on the left-hand side image is flying into the left atrium. Can you guys see that? It's, it's, it's flailing across the, uh, across the valve. And the right-hand side image shows that there is uh, severe eccentric mitral regurgitation close to where the defect is. 
So the mechanism of ischemic MR is slightly different. Um, here is a pap muscle with cordae and the mitral valve leaflets. And normally during systole, they close and the pap muscle keeps it tethered so that the mitral valve leaflets uh, do not go backwards into the atrium. If an infarct affects this wall where the, where the purple segment is, the cordae are pulled downwards so that the leaflets can't fully co-opt or close, resulting in mitral regurgitation. Does that make sense? It's called a tenting force. And the tenting height can also be, can also be measured. Is that something commonly yeah. you, you, Absolutely. you look at? Yeah. yeah. So upon performing this echocardiogram, the parasite on one axis reveals that the posterior mitral valve leaflet in this particular situation is tethered. Um, and you can also see that the basal posterior wall is hypokinetic. So sorry, going back to this image. So the, the posterior mitral valve leaf leaflet is tethered backwards and this results in this mitral regurgitation from occurring, which points to an ischemic etiology. And this is re-demonstrated in this apical four chamber view as well. So acute MR, uh, the timing is normally one to five days, and the murmur cannot, may not be obvious as there can be early equalization of left atrial and left end uh, ventricle end diastolic pressures. The combination of hypotension and pulmonary edema post MI should prompt an urgent echocardiogram and the patient should be referred to valve surgery early. Um, so it's important to listen to the chest for murmurs after an MI for VSDs and MR as well. All right, here is another impressive example. What do people what do people think of this one? I might just move this yeah, screen up. So oh, they'll be able to see it. It's just the, oh, okay, I see it. It's an exciting one, guys. Emma, are you there? I can go yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Oh, no, I'm Emma. driving Kadar, sorry. You're missing out. Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> uh, so this is a uh, this is a transthoracic echocardiogram. There's an apical three chamber um, that demonstrates a disruption of the uh, myocardium on the infralateral wall. Yep, it appears to communicate with um, the pericardium. Are you sure? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Appear, appears to communicate with the pericardium um, mm. as there is a um, there is a change in the echogenicity um, between the between the myocardial wall and what appears to be the pericardium. I'd like to look in other views to determine whether um, whether that's the case. Uh, there is a uh, color flow Doppler placed over the, um, the um, lesion in the uh, infralateral wall that shows, um, that shows flow in and out of the defect. Yep. And I, I can't really see the last one. Oh, and the last one is a parasternal long, which, yeah, I guess uh, um, correlates the same finding. Um, looks like there might be some. Sorry, this picture's a bit too small. That's uh, okay. Maybe maybe some involvement in the papillary muscle. Yeah, you're right. So essentially, what, what what's happening here? What's happened here is that the the posterior wall there's a contained free wall rupture. This is called a contained free wall rupture. Um, which is imminently going to punch through to the pericardium, uh, in which case the patient will, will um, you know, not have a good outcome <laughs> shortly afterwards. So, so this is actually the, the most feared complication of, of, a, of a STEMI. Uh, it contributes to about 10% of mortality per STEMIs. Uh, it's very rare in the modern era. And uh, you have to have patients or late, present, late presenters who uh, delay seeking medical attention. Di timing is normally five to 14 days post MI. Uh, risk factors include Q waves and initial ECG, a large territory MI, 
Um, that sort of right bundle branch sort of uh, picture we saw initially with the STEMI, that's another risk factor for this as well. Um, the, the circumflex artery supplies the posterior wall, wraps around and supplies the posterior wall. So large circumflex lesions, osteal circ, proximal circ lesions in left dominant systems uh, can predispose you to this as well. Uh, age above 70. So primary PCI and beta blockers are the main ways of, of reducing um, bad outcomes in this particular situation. And am I right in saying that you've got to be quite, um, you, you've got to leave these guys for at least a week or two to let the myocardium almost demarcate because you mm. can't go and operate on them straight away because mm. there's all the uh, inflammation, I guess. Exactly. Around. Is that right? That's right. So actually a bit longer than that. Um, mm. the, the surgeons, uh, so first of all, early surgery, instant surgical referral is, is necessary. Yeah. If you ever see a, a necrocardiogram like this, um, because of the imminent risk of rupture. And the surgeons will generally defer operating for a few weeks, uh, you know, three to four weeks even, because of the friability of the myocardium yeah, sure. uh, until it scars over, in, in, in which case a patch repair may be warranted. How did that patient do? That patient survived. Nice. That patient survived. I think Kylie's, Kylie's asking a question. Kylie, did you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Um, I'm really enjoying this talk. <laughs> I'm at a small hospital where we would have to transfer this particular patient out very rapidly. I'm just yeah. interested to know what immediate resuscitative measures you'd advise. I mean, I'm just assuming you'd want to drop the blood pressure as low as it can go and try and reduce the shear stresses. But how would you manage this person on the way to surgery? Yeah, look, that's an, that's an important question. I think um, obviously strict bed rest, uh, close observation monitoring. Um, I wouldn't uh, initiate, uh, you know, beta beta blockade can be useful in the acute setting to reduce heart rate and blood pressure, but not too much. Mm -hmm. uh, maintaining hemodynamics within a very low, uh, sort of narrow range. Um, we don't want them to become hypotensive to reduce a blunt cardiac output, but at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, if, if the heart, if the blood pressure goes too high, that can increase shear stresses and so on. But essentially, um, patients often kept in CCU or ICUs for multiple weeks with daily or we, uh, twice or thrice weekly echocardiograms to to reassess the the left ventricular wall in the situation. The other thing to consider is patients can develop effusions, uh, and they are important to be drained as early as possible as well. Nice, nice. Okay, so what about this, this situation? So the right-hand side image is an MRI scan um, and left-hand left -hand side image is an echocardiogram. Does that differ slightly to what you saw before? Hatim, you wanna have another look at this? Yeah, so that looks like an apical two chamber view, the one on the left hand side, with an aneurysm uh, of the basal septum, uh, because I can't see it. It would be of the inferior wall, uh, and probably it's still contained because I cannot see any pericardial effusion as such. Mm. Uh, on the left hand side one, this is an MRI of the heart. And uh, again, that looks like, again, like a contained rupture within the septum or the- Which, which wall, wall would that be? Which I think, I, I think what I can see on the echo, it looks like more like to be the inferior wall of the heart. On the MRI, it looks like within the septum. So I'm not entirely sure. Maybe where... inferior septum, inferior septum. Yeah. Because we've got, we got four chambers, probably the inferior septum is conducive. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so, so this is actually more in keeping with a pseudo aneurysm um, uh, on both images because it communicates with the body of the left ventricular cavity through a narrow neck. So if it communicates via a narrow neck as opposed to a more ballooned out appearance, uh, it's known as a pseudo aneurysm, which has a high risk of rupture. So again, these patients are important to be referred to a surgical center as early as possible. Um, in terms of management, you wouldn't do anything really different apart from close observation in the acute setting. Are those the same patients? Same thing, yeah. So uh, pericardial complications are important as well. So essentially, um, uh, pericarditis, uh, effusion and drizzle syndrome, uh, which are uh, proportional to the infarct size. 
So a post a peri MI pericarditis occurs usually uh, soon after STEMI, day to one, uh, day one to three, and it's transient. Uh, auscultation reveals a rub. There are raised inflammatory markers, as it was the case in this particular individual, Mr. SR. And the treatment is normally with aspirin and colchicine, which is preferred. Uh, avoidance of NSAIDs or steroids in the um, acute period because they could potentially cause scar thinning and infarct expansion. Uh, another echocardiogram. This should be fairly easy. Joe, are you working clinically? I don't know if you're still there, are you, Joe? Yep, I'm still here. Oh, cool. Sorry, I thought you might go. Um, so the left picture is a uh, apical four chamber with um, a very large pericardial um, effusion um, that looks quite simple in nature because I can't see any um, kind of floating debris or tethering. Um, but I'd need to see if it clinically correlates with some hypotension to see and an ECG to see if there's any diastolic um, um, problems with the RV free wall. Um, if, but if looking worried at, about, so if you're worried about tamponade, tamponade what yeah. sort of echo, echo features would you be looking for? Um, uh, so collapse of the RV free wall in uh, uh, diastole. Yep. Um, the bottom right picture is a subcostal um, full chamber view. Um, Again, I just had to look at the ECG, but there's definitely um, wobbling of the free wall that I'd see have to see if that coincides with the um, ECG for diastole. Um, but again, a very large pericardial um, effusion. Yep. Yep, you're right. You're very good. And Joe, what are the other echo features of tamponade? I know it's a clinical diagnosis. You said RV free wall collapse and diastole. Can you give me the others? Um, what about the RA? Uh, so RA is collapsed. Yeah. And when's that in the cardiac cycle? Throughout the cardiac cycle. Yeah, no, absolutely it can be. And I guess that's the sign, a more uh, certain or sensitive sign of, um, uh, of tamponade, the longer it's collapsed for. And they classically talk about it being the lowest portion, which is normally during ventricular systole. Uh, and then what about flows? Uh, what about Doppler signs? Can you remember those? Um, no, I can't. We could talk about flow variation across the uh, LV inflow and also across the RV inflow. And classically, we talk about, it depends what you, which uh, guidelines you read, but it's either sort of 25 to 40% respiratory variation across mm -hmm. the LV inflow views. So just pulse wave Doppler at the top of the mitral valve leaflets, and you get a big swing in the E wave velocity, but you get an even bigger swing on the RV side. And that's all, so you get about, again, depends on what guidelines you read, 40 to 60% variation with respiration in the RV inflow uh, velocities. Um, so again, a really common DDU question. Mm -hmm. We normally ask it somehow once every other year or something. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just good to know. But of course, the, the main statement is it's a clinical diagnosis backed up by echo. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And and it's often minimal or mild in, in STEMIs, but uh, occurs associated with a higher incidence of morbidity and mortality. Mechanisms could include hemorrhagic pericarditis or transmural infarction with a free wall rupture. Um, important differentials is distal bioperforation. So after mm -hmm. primary PCI, it's really important uh, anyone who's doing the angiogram to always screen uh, with x-ray at the distal wire tip where the wire is to make sure it hasn't perforated through. But we have had one case last year where there was actually a distal wire perforation leading to, to um, tamponade six hours later after the case. Um, if, you know, and frank blood will be aspirated. Anyone know how, well, after pericardiocentesis, how to tell if you get a bloody tap, the difference between blood and, 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 and fluid? Is that just where the clots on the sheet? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can square onto a plastic or a sheet that if it clots, then it's it's frank blood, and you know you've got uh, ruptures or, or uh, oh. perforation somewhere. So Dresler syndrome was first described in 1956 um, by William Dresler, and it's a relatively late complication of myocardial infarction occurring 
weeks to months post MI. It's uncommon in the modern era and it's usually an autoimmune inflammatory condition or reaction to my antimyocardial antigens. But the mainstay of treatment of this is with aspirin and steroids used in some refractory cases. It can be associated with an effusion, so it's important to make a cardiogram early. And lastly, in terms of rhythmic complications, these are quite common um, when STEMIs occur. I know quite a few, and, and, and recently as well, there have been quite a few um, VT and VF event, uh, events surrounding myocardial infarctions. Either the patient's arrested en route or they have arrhythmias on the table. So it's important. The so premature ventricular ectopics uh, frequently occur after MIs. You do an irritable myocardium. There's no routine role for suppression, but can use beta blockade to reduce the frequency of this if, if they are frequent, uh, along with electrolyte repletion. Um, ventricular tachycardias, uh, non-sustained VT is lasting for less than 30 seconds, does not confer a high mortality risk, but sustained VT uh, can deteriorate into VF. And so it's important to recognize a telemetry with prompt correction of electrolytes. Uh, the greater the infarct size, or if there's LV dysfunction, the higher the chance of sustained VT. Um, ventricular fibrillation, the highest incidence is the first hour after a STEMI, uh, but secondary VF more than 48 hours after a STEMI occurs in patients with large infarcts or left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, treatment as per research guidelines. And it, what do people think this is? Mm -hmm. That's him. you want to take this one? Either Hatim or, or Lewis? Block, yeah, it looks suspicious for complete heart block. Yeah. yeah. Like complete heart block. The great looking issue. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so the risk of bradyarrhythmia arrhythmias is, is with inferior and posterior infarcts almost three times greater than anterior infarcts. Where if you have a, a large LAD which wraps around the inferior wall, you can also get complete heart block with that. Uh, sinus bradycardia and asymptomatic or stable patients do not need to be treated. But if the patient develops high degree AV blocks, such as Mervich type 2 or complete heart block, this signifies a significant conduction system disruption and pacing should be considered. Um, so going back to our, our patient of SR, he was a late presentation uh, MI. It highlights that even in the younger patients where acute coronary syndrome may not spring to mind, the diagnosis should always be considered. Uh, late presentations lead to poorer outcomes, especially if chest pain symptoms are discounted. Uh, large infarcts may uh, tend to affect the conduction system, especially of inferior infarcts causing high degree AV blocks. And it highlights the importance of close monitoring in echocardiography post infarct complications that may occur and underappreciated in the modern era. Any questions? Oh, great talk. Thanks, Kadar. That was awesome. Always. That was really comprehensive. It was great. Any, any questions for Kadar? Yeah, I do. Uh, thanks, Kadar. That was. Great. Um, apologize for being late. Um, SCAD, how do you tell if it's, how do you tell if it's SCAD or if it's uh, because of the wire, the atrogenic? SCAD, SCAD or the wire. Um, look, that can be difficult to discern. Normally with SCAD, uh, as you know, there's, there's three lines, uh, three types of SCAD. Uh, classically, uh, the SCAD that we see is where there's a, there's a, a normal segment of, of, of vessel that then narrows or thins and then becomes normal again. Um, when you say wire, do you mean uh, wire perforation or the wire itself causing narrowing? No, wire perforation. Wire perf so with wire perforation, what you normally see is a contrast blush, and that's normally denoted by the Ellis, uh, Ellis uh, classification. So Ellis type one, two, three. Um, when, you, when you screen the patient with X-ray and inject contrast, you'll see a blush there. Um, which indicates that that contrast is leaking out into the pericardial space. Um, the SCAD generally will have a contained uh, a, a sort of a dissection with a, with, with a line that goes through and separates two parts of the contrast um, that, that indicates the dissection. It's a bit difficult to, to explain without actually having the, the images there, but that's essentially the difference. The one is sort of a cloud of contrast that's seeping out, and the other one is sort of a contained, contained dissection that you can see. Yeah, I guess uh, that so a perforation versus a dissection. But the my understanding is a wire. Your wire can still cause contained dissection. Is there any sort of characteristics in terms of location or anything that you look at? Or 
Yeah, so why is chemical dissections? And again, uh, it's important to screen for that. Um, so, so again, the, the, the fundamental difference between that and perforations is, is whether the, the general shape of the vessel is, is maintained um, and, and if there's a cloud forming outside the vessel. So it's all about where the contrast is essentially. Yeah. So Kizar, just to summarize very quickly, you're talking about the most common complications there for our poor LV function yeah. uh, and, this, and arrhythmias, the arrhythmias, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. mitral valve abnormalities, mitral rego is probably from tethering. tethering yes. And then you get the rare ones such as free wall rupture, ventricular yeah. uh, septal rupture, uh, and papillary muscle rupture. The other thing we've been seeing quite quite often is the formation of left ventricular atrial thrombus. Yeah, of so course. It's course important course. to consider. Um, especially in large infarcts with, with, um, with aneurysmal segments, um, always consider doing a contrast echo as well early. Good cool. oh, sorry, you might have said, and I've missed it as I'm driving, but um, talking about L LV aneurysms there, have you seen many uh, pseudo aneurysms? Because obviously they're a whole different entity and treated very differently, and you don't medically manage those like you would a true aneurysm. Have you yes. seen any of them? I guess just some echo tips for us all to how you would differentiate between a true and a pseudo aneurysm on echo? Good question. Yeah, look, I haven't seen a pseudo aneurysm myself, but um, they are quite rare in the modern era. The, the, the fundamental difference between a pseudo aneurysm and aneurysm, I guess, is the, the narrowing of the neck and, and the formation of almost a separate chamber um, with a pseudo aneurysm as opposed to an aneurysmal segment, which is sort of a blown out segment um, normally the apex that you can see. Uh, aneurysms, as you mentioned, do require surgical input. No, I've never seen one either. Yeah, I haven't seen one. Yeah. Well, could okay. I thank you very, very much indeed. I think that's time. Thank uh, just you. thanks again, mate. That was an absolutely fantastic yes, lecture. Yes. I think we've got you one more time to talk about contrast echo, echocardiography later on in the year. Um, we really look forward to that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thank See you later. Much. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much.